Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first 48 forward and it, it seems extremely interesting and very well put up. So, so looking forward to this. My name is Johannes Nutin and I'm the lead of international markets at Demos Helsinki. Uh, when my gran grandfather asked me what I do for a living, I, I actually say that I have the best job in the world because I, I go around Europe and, and help big European companies and public sector institutions on, on figuring out what type of future they should push, push for. What type of future should they be advocating for in the 10 to 15 year time span? Um, that's something that, that's, that's interesting for me, exciting for me, um, because we're looking into both what, what makes sense for business, but also what makes sense for society. In a job like mine, or, or probably all of ours, we have to be optimists. And, and I actually do believe that the future will look better it will be, look brighter, but it will look radically, radically different. In the next 19 minutes, I'll be talking a bit about societal transformation, so a very, very broad topic. I'll explain a bit about what type of societal transformation we believe that we're in now, not only in Finland, but also in, 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 in Germany, in Europe as a, as a whole. Then I'll talk a bit about why companies should be pushing for progressive societal transformation, and then give a few pointers of what that actually might look like and what are the first questions that we need to ask. So, first a few words of Demos Helsinki, because I'm, I'm guessing not everyone knows who, who we are. Demos Helsinki is an, uh, Nordic, the leading Nordic independent think tank. Our reason of existence is basically pushing a societal transformation that's fair, sustainable and profitable. So we are very much working on a high-level, big impact agenda of societal transformation. The way we actually do it is not only through wonderful keynotes and, and, and attending seminars and, and, and events, but we actually do pragmatic work with different, different institutions. We work with public sector institutions and private sector institutions on defining their role in the future, what type of future they should be pushing on. So we work with corporate visions, strategies and business models. There are 60 of us, uh, still mostly based in Helsinki. Actually, we just opened our, our operations in, in Germany as well, which we're very proud of. Uh, before I go into societal transformation, we obviously have to understand what are the forces that actually drive that big change? What are the two big issues that drive our transformation as a society, as businesses and as individuals? These are not a surprise for everyone, but they still need to be stated. There are two fundamental shifts that are happening in the world. One is climate change and the other is rapid di digitalization. One can see one is exclusively a threat, I'm talking about climate change. One is an opportunity, but as Nico very well put, there are obvious threats in, in digitalization as well. So very quickly about climate change, we all know that the issue is strong, it's big, we've known it for 30 years, but actually we're beginning to be in a very big hurry. Uh, we're losing billions of, of dollars every year uh, ca caused by climate abruption in, in, in agriculture. We, we know the IPCC report put it very, very clearly for us that, that if we want to stay in a 1.5 Celsius climate, uh, climate change world, which is the maximum that we as a human species can, can afford, we actually have to get out of, of coal as an energy form in 10 years. 10 years is kind of a short time for a big systemic transformation, so actually we should start we should start 15 years ago, but let's maybe start tomorrow or maybe Monday because we're all still here at the conference. Digitalization is something that most of the people have been talking about here on stage. So very fast, this is something that's obviously a big transformation in, in society. It's changing the way we interact with each other. It's changing the way we work, how we create value, how we vote. It's changing all the different aspects of our society. And for us as demos, it's obvious that the key question we need to be asking is whether digitalization is very good for us as consumers, we know that it is, but is it also good for us as people and as citizens? And that's the big question that we're asking. And these two big, they're not even megatrends, they're gigatrends or something like that. These two big issues are driving a big fundamental societal transformation in Finland, in Germany, and all over the world. And we actually believe that the transformation we're experiencing now is as big as the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago. So there are distinct similarities between the two points in time, where we are now and the early 19th century, in where, where Industrial Revolution basically started. 
few data points that kind of show the linkage between the two, two parts of time. First of all, there's obviously new technological solutions that have a big potential impact on our economy. We have digital tools which are already fundamentally transforming the way we do business. We've heard it in, in, in pre presentations of AI and so forth. In the Industrial Revolution, the new technological solutions were very different. I mean, we had trains, we had steam engines, we had el electricity, obviously big transformative technologies of that day. That's the first kind of similarity between two eras. Secondly, there's a big, um, how should I put it? There's actually a stagnation of median wages in Europe at the moment. So for the past 15 years, median wages, so basically what a normal person earns, they're not rising anymore, they're kind of, in, in real terms, they're st staying roughly similar. And this is something that happened also in the early 19th century. This is what economists call the Engels pause. Basically, productivity rises, but wages don't rise with that. We see it in, in the news, we, some of us feel it in a very personal life as well. This is what kind of creates social, uh, social upheaval, this is what creates yellow vests, this is what creates people who are angry for a reason. A very big similarity between our current day and the Industrial Revolution. And finally, and I think even most importantly, there's a big anticipation of what the future will look like. Pew Research Center did a piece of research that was actually fundamental for me at least, that said that out of all of Europeans, 28% of people believe that their children will be better off than they are. Turning that around, almost three out of four of us believe that the future will be worse for our children than for us which is obviously huge. Let's do a quick raise of hands. Who, who of us believes that the future will be better for our children than for us? Who believes it, it will be worse? Roughly 50-50, so we're a very kind of a bit more optimistic crowd than, than a general European population. But this is obviously fundamental, and this is a big, big thing that com combines, or kind of combines the two eras. We don't know what the future will hold because we all have a feeling, it's a gut feeling, that something big is happening. We don't actually know where we're going as a society or as individuals. And that's major, major news. Basically, the situation we're in is, is, is exactly this. Some of us, I think my, myself included, are very, very techno-optimistic. We believe that the future will be bright, it will be great, we'll solve all our problems and then just kind of sip lattes for the day. And then a lot of the big, big proportion of people actually are longing for something more simple, something more clear, because the future is somehow very frightening. And this is not an abstract point, because it's very, very personal. It's in our own lives. We don't know what the next year or the next 10 years will look like. It makes planning our lives very, very hard. We're basically lacking a big societal vision, as Germany, I'm guessing, as Finland, as Europe, or as a globe. On each and every level, we're lacking societal vision. We don't know what the transformation holds in it. This is my favorite quote, which I think really, really well puts the, the kind of it's kind of a zeitgeist, zeitgeist quote. It's old, but it's still very relevant. The crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. We Probably most of us feel this very, very well, in a personal level as well. We know that the old models of working, we know that the old models of, of mass production, mass consumption, how we've organized our lives, that's kind of old somehow, but we don't know what the new thing is yet. We have the bits and pieces, we have the technology, we have cool new things, we have new, new ways of working and thinking and living, but there is no... The new is not here yet, and this is the period that we're living in. Back in the Industrial Revolution, the whole kind of transformation took roughly 100 years, which is a long time. And then the thing that all of us should be interested in about, we're futurists, business leaders, whoever, we should be interested in making that time frame shorter. So we can't, as a, as a society, as people, we don't want to live in this type of unknown state for 100 years, but we should ha actually try to make it as short as we can, and that's what we should work on. So. My big argument that is in, in this type, these types of transformations, companies have always been pushing for change. This is self-evident when looking at history. I'm a futurist, but actually you, you, you've noticed that, that I look at history quite a lot because history is a very, very good place to start. We don't have to do the same mistakes again. 
So looking into the future, actually the history is a very good place to start. So companies have always been pushing change in transformational moments. The past, or the time, time period between the 1950s and the early 2000s, roughly, I mean, these are not science, they're kind of intuitions, but that period was actually a very stable period in, in Europe, in, in developed societies. We were very stable. Companies could basically be very comfortable in relying on a social contract that, okay, if, if I'm a CEO and I, I pay, my, pay my taxes, I, I follow legislation, I'm kind of well set. So then my company produces some, some nice goods, they produce a nice service or something, I employ people, I get a profit out of it, and the whole thing kind of works very well. And so it did. It was a very, very nice model, but this actually doesn't work anymore in a transformation. In a transformation, there is no reliable social contract that companies could rely on, and that's why companies need to be taking a more proactive stance on societal transformation. That's why companies need to start building societal visions. It's not, it's not because it's moral, it's not because it's right, it's actually because it also makes financial sense. So, so looking into, Nico talked about the GAFAs, looking into the recent news about Facebook kind of tells us that, I mean, they've been in a big crisis in the past, past year or so. They've been in the news a lot, they've been in, the, in, in public hearings on, on their Cambridge Analytic, uh, Russian, uh, no, that was a Freudian. It wasn't the Russian election, it was the American election. Uh, Basically, we know, all know the story, so this is, this is the kind of situation where they've been... For me, it's a very clear kind of argument for this. They've already, always thought that if we do what, what legislators ask from us, we're fine. That's not fine. You have to actually have a proactive... You have to have a proactive stance of what, what type of society you're building, what type of vision do you have for the society, and you have to be open about it. That's what they fail to do. Boston Consulting Group and, and McKinsey, the kind of big consulting uh, houses, made a, made a research on, on kind of the financial side of this as well. They, they made an analysis that basically 9% of companies are, are market shaping, so the ones that are pushing for industry transformation, pushing for market transformation, pushing for societal transformation. 9% of companies fall into that category, and those companies actually make 64% more profit. It's kind of a, it's an easy business case to say, taking an active transform transformative agenda is common business sense. I'll use my final uh, historical example before I go into more practical stuff. We're in southern Germany, which is kind of an automotive part of the world, uh, so I, I, I will use the, the historical example of the automotive sector uh, from the previous mobility transformation. This is not a self-explanatory picture, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. So basically, 80 years ago, the automotive sector was, was a niche sector, or a niche industry. We had a beautiful new innovation, which was called the car, or the vehicle, or the automobile, or whatever you called it. But the market for it was very, very small. It was kind of a, it was a gadget, a very nice gadget, and a very cool gadget, kind of an expensive one. But still, it wasn't a big, big issue for everyday people. The automotive sector understood this, and they actually took a very proactive, proactive stance on shaping society and building the society of the 20, 20th century then. This picture is from, from a General Motors uh, exhibition. So, so 1939, there was a kind of, they, they had these States Fair uh, exhibitions in New York, basically kind of a gathering of innovators and new cool stuff, kind of the, the 48, 48 forward of the 20th century. And General Motors brought their exhibition. They didn't bring the car, they didn't bring anything kind of related to that, but they actually built a small city. Cities in the early 20th century were kind of, to be honest, they were kind of shitty. Uh, cities where there was a lot of pollution, it was very crowded, the, the, the houses were horrible, and the city space, urban life was not a very nice, nice way to, to use your time. And actually General Motors had this kind of vision of the city that, what if the city looks like this in the modern era? What if we have a very kind of small center of the town where we can do our shopping and kind of meet people and with cafes and restaurants and then we would have specific places where we would work, we would have specific places where factories would be so that they don't pollute our lives. What if uh, there would be kind of specific places where we would live and we would have a bit of space around us, we would have a yard and we could do our barbecue and, and so forth. It's very nice. It's a nice urban vision. The thing that they left out and the thing that the kind of self-explanatory big point for them is that obviously you need a car to, to move around in a city like this. 
you need to have some type of vehicle from getting to very distinctly from A to B to C to D, etc. The business case for, for General Motors and the automotive sector was very, very clear. They basically built an urban vision for the 20th century, and obviously for the 20th century, the automotive sector is one of the most profitable, biggest industries that we can think of. Obviously, this vision doesn't work anymore, and we have to renew it. And actually, some of the work that we as Demos do is actually renewing these types of urban visions into new mobility services. So what are the visions? What type of cities do we want to, to build when we're talking about new mobility services, when we can't rely on individual car ownership as strongly as we did, did in the previous years or century? And then what, what can companies actually do? So what, what do the transformative companies of our 21st century do at the moment. The boring fact is that obviously when the problems are very universal and the problems are global, the actual solutions are very local, so they're nation-specific, region-specific, they're industry-specific, they're even company-specific, so there are no kind of quick fixes that I can share to you. Do these things and go home and we've, we've got it all figured out. But there are a couple of questions that are, are important to start answering. Most companies at the moment are talking about platforms. Platforms are a revolutionary new business model. We all know about them. We all know about Ubers. We know about Apples. We know about um, all of this. But actually, the transformative companies of 2019 uh, are talking about platform governance. I think this is what Nico already touched upon very well. How are platforms regulated? How do platforms manage their ecosystem. Platforms can't have externalities anymore. If you're an Airbnb, there's no way you can anymore say that, okay, what happens in our company happens in our company. We're not responsible for the, the ecosystem effects of our business. That's why, why Airbnb got closed out of Barcelona and, and, and uh, Amsterdam, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So platform governance is one of the key things that companies need to, need to start talking about and need to start having a proactive stance on. When I went to school, it was kind of the very clear truism of, of business was scale. It was, we have to have global solutions and global processes, and that's what brings us, brings us to the kind of market leader position. Actually, that's not the case anymore in the 21st century. Global processes, sure, you have to have efficiencies from somewhere, but actually having very local solutions, very tailored solutions in a local market is a very, very good way to go forward. I'll use another example of kind of the digital giants or the digital kind of success stories of, of the 21st century. Uber, which is great. I Ubered here. I like it. But actually, they're, they're experiencing a lot of difficulties in new markets. They had to sell their business in China. More recently, they sold their business in, South, the, in Southeast Asia just for the fact that they don't understand the local market context anymore that well that they should have. They, they, they sell, sell their businesses in these type of new markets to the local players. In, in Southeast Asia, Asia, basically, they sold their business to, to, an, to a company called Grab. Uh, Grab did three things. Basically, they, they had the local languages as de kind of uh, default solutions in, in their app. You can use cash, and you words, weren't forced to use uh, credit cards, which were still short supply in, in Southeast Asia. And thirdly, they took security concerns seriously, which was important for the people in the local market. So local solutions is something that, that transformative companies are building. Market-driven strategy versus market-driving strategy. Again, how business is taught for us still, it's you have to, as a, as a business leader or as a strategy director, you have to understand the market that you're playing in, what are the market's boundaries, what are the other competitions, and then you have to find your niche or your blue ocean or whatever the metaphor is. And actually, some of the transformative companies are driving markets. What General Motors did with kind of building their Futurama exhibition is building a new market somewhere where, where there is no market anymore. So driving the market is something that's crucial when you want to be a transformative company. And finally, I already mentioned this. We can't anymore react to, ch to changing rules. The legislation is not keeping up. We have to have a pro pushing the rules of the game. We've actually just started a collaboration with a company, a, a, a mobility company, and actually figuring out in a specific urban context whether mobility could be free in that, that place, whether it could be paid through, through the government, through, the, through data, through advertising, what are the different business models that are in free mobility. The other thing that we're looking into is whether a mobility company could pay their taxes 
not in money, but actually in product. So it's not about millions or, and, and dollars or euros or yens or whatever, but it's actually in minutes or kilometers, which is actually a fundamental transformation in pushing rules of the game. This requires new capabilities for companies. It requires a very kind of open approach. It requires, in a way, how should I put it? Companies need to be very good at negotiating, building collaborations, and being very, very open about what type of society they want to build. Finally, I'm talking about big issues. Uhdessa is, is together in Finnish. Uh, we have our 60 people working on issues like this, but we're not going to be able to transform the society alone. Uh, so we're hoping to build a network of different types of advocators for future, different types of innovators, different types of business people, public sector people, and we're, try we're not doing this alone. So I would urge you, if you're working on similar issues, if you want to be working on similar issues, please be in contact. I know the, the mediums I've put, it, put there are not the most progressive ones, but as a, as a digital user, I'm actually quite conservative. So give me a call. Thank you.